hi everybody uh, we're just going to start in one minute or so so uh, it would be appreciable if you give me a thumbs up if my network and my voice is okay yeah just give me a thumbs up if, if my uh, net and voice is okay Okay, that's cool. That's fair enough. Thank you, everybody. So I think we have just two minutes to go. So are you all excited for today's session? As we're going to talk about some evidences and little more insight about it. At six, I will be start giving my introduction. But before that, uh, I just wanted to know like how much you guys are really wanted to know about this topic, forensic evidences and criminal evidences, all related to Indian Evidence Act. Because Indian Evidence Act is my heart and soul. Yeah, so just in one minute, I'm going to start. And I would personally suggest everybody to take a notebook and a pen with yourself because I would be talking about few cases. So for that fact, if you needed to write it down. at six okay let's get started so hi everybody hi I am Sakshi I am an advocate practicing at Delhi High Court and I am a founder of law bear point zero one that's a Instagram page uh, Apart from my advocacy, yes, I am a judicial aspirant. I have given Delhi Judicial Services exam, but couldn't make up to the interview by few marks. And I'm just trying to work hard for other states also. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the virtual lawyer team who has given me this opportunity to talk about such a... I think this is something which is such an exciting topic. To discuss with and having said that Indian Evidence Act 1872 is my go-to act every time I am so good at I think that I'm so good at speaking about Indian Evidence Act so once again let me just introduce the topic for today's live session and it is forensic evidences and criminal evidences their admissibility in the Indian Evidence Act 1872 right now, I think like before I start commenting on this topic, I would really have written a good thought. Maybe everybody would be like aligned with my thought. And it says that everything in the world you see is a reality or it is just a mere illusion. Well, everything in the world and the world itself is nothing, just to full of delusional facts so thank you everybody and let's just get started on today's topic what do you mean by evidences like we have seen a lot of evidences we have seen evidences medically we have seen evidences forensic we have seen criminal evidences civil evidences taught evidences contractual evidences why these evidences are important 
like any statements that you submitted before the court for the court to accept it to admit it that becomes your evidence right having said that evidences could be like documentary evidences and evidences could be your oral evidences if you have your uh, indian evidence i bear it along with you you can definitely get into the definition of evidences which is mentioned right in the section 2 or 3 i guess of the main page and talking about the oral evidences definition and the uh, uh, primary document evidences definition that is marked in the section 59 from onwards now when i said that those statements that you present before the court so that the court just have a view of it and the court accepts it and then it can take into its own purview for an admission so i think i should not be explaining you what admission is because everybody know about it admission is defined in the section 17 of indian evidence act so kindly look into it now talking about evidences and its type let's just get into our main topic which is relevant to forensic evidences and criminal evidences forensic evidences are those evidences which are related to the science of actually getting to know about how the things has happened what is the in detailing of the fact that has caused what has lead to this scene whether there were injuries what kind of injuries were there was this the footprint of those person who has committed a crime so basically forensic science evidences are those evidences which involves the critical analysis of your footprints of your dna of anything which is related to science biology chemistry physics which then become associated with law according to indian evidence act which is nowhere written but just to make you understand those science when comes align with law becomes forensic law now why forensic law evidences must be added uh, in our indian law why there is so much of use about it right i think the most of the benefits that i have written by myself they are one that forensic evidences gives you a clear picture of how the incident would have taken place second that it free it is free of ambiguity because when i say that forensic evidences we are needed to be submitted before the court related to any of the facts of the matter it has to be free of ambiguity it is not something which is you know non durable or unstable or something which is very much you know confusing so it must be free from all kind of ambiguity the third point that i wrote here is like the deep analysis of the accused background which includes the accused mental condition includes emotional conditions physical conditions the behavioral pattern because i think that being an advocate it is very much important to understand what is the behavioral pattern of the accused and that can only be understood by using the forensic evidences by using the science and the technology to get upon it right the fourth point that i have wrote it down here is like it may link with some other new or undiscovered kind of offenses that you might have never known if the forensic science evidences may not come in pace uh i think everybody has this question when i talk about this forensic science evidences like what is dna and why dna is such a huge i would say an achievement to be used as a kind of evidences against the accused or maybe in the favor of prosecution but why it is not so admissible before the indian courts i have a i have an answer for that um i believe first of all going into that deep i would be little bit telling you about the dna so dna the full form of dna everybody should know so this is the gk question i am giving it to you so dna means deoxyribolic nucleic acid what does that actually have so it's a living organism it's a cell right so it gives a blueprint of the genetics of an individual now coming back to the point that dna is such a vast concept yet some of the people are very unknown about it yet the court is not fully accepted 
you know dna as a complete source of conclusive proof i tell you uh the first time that the dna was included and used as a conclusive proof of evidence was in the in england case and it was a case which is named by ender by right and in 1984 the first time the dna used for any kind of forensic analysis in england was used by sir aj jeffrey so he was a man who just used dna he analyzes the dna he functioned upon it like what kind of information this dna contains and how can this dna can become useful in favor of your prosecutor and in against your accused now as i have already mentioned that evidences sorry as i already mentioned that evidences and your forensic science evidences are goes hand on hand so one is the general genesis and another one is the species right now since every individual is different you are different i am different a b c d everybody is different so why there is a need to have a dna as a conclusive proof what happen is for example that i think that let's take an example of a and b who got into this affray right who got into this affray and uh, affray is mentioned basically in the section 159 of ipc you may just check that definition so if a and b have got into this affray and that lead to the killing of one person by another person for example b died now we need to check was that the direct blow from a to the b or it was somebody else who initiated this killing of b right if there were no evidences then obviously we the police or the investigation team would be looking up for the circumstantial evidences right there are two different kinds of evidences one is like mitigating evidences and another one is circumstantial evidences circumstantial evidences are also those evidences where there is nobody who is seeing and watching it hearing it rather the bits and pieces all around the i would say uh, offensive area have those kind of little bit of uh, evidences that can be used as a circumstantial evidences right now using dna in this concept can be very helpful where the dna of i would say accused which is b who had been killed by a or you can take a dna of a and then the dna would like dna could be in the process of hair semen body fluid it could be your blood it could be your urine it could be your semen everything that matters that gives you a specific generalization of your own body type that is dna so dna becomes very handy very easy and you can use that before the court later at stage i would be telling you that why indian courts do not consider dna to be an conclusive proof now you know what uh, talking about indian scenario and indian courts now the main uh, main database starts section 45 of indian evidence act 1872 it talks about the expert opinions right what happen is like whenever there is a question arises before the court that we need to test you know somebody's veracity we need to test to impeach the characters of any other person we need to test whether this handwriting was written by this person or not so all these are things which a normal person failed to express where the court is under the dilemma that we need to call upon an expert opinion on certain matter which kind of weapon used whether this was the weapon that can used to kill this person and having it committed about this offense or not right how deep the injury is whether this handwriting belongs to this person whether this handwriting was been written by this ink or not so it goes into very deep analysis right so section 45 came into play that time now this is what i've talked about section 45 of indian evidence act talks about the expert opinion given before the court anybody can give an expert opinion who is registered medical practitioner 
as I would be like a little bit giving you a view of CRPC whereas like section 53 and 54 would be talking about medical examination of an accused which is 53 and medical examination of an arrested person which is 54. So these are the two sections of CRPC that could have a medical examination of an accused and arrested person and moreover they then submit the full report to the police station inspector and those then went up to the sorry those then uh, goes up to the court um section 45 after all i said now let me talk about section 46 and then i'll tell you like what is the two main facets of section 45 and 46 and how the judiciary our indian courts work upon this now section 46 basically points out that facts which is not otherwise relevant becomes relevant if they support or are inconsistent with the opinion of experts when such opinions are relevant for example there the accused for example the accused have failed to mention his own grounds of uh, offense and he has no proof against uh, in favor of him so this expert opinion has been called by the prosecutor so the prosecutor's expert opinion comes so for example the medical practitioner who has uh, taken the dna who has known about the use of weapon so he came in and he tells about exactly what he found and he has submitted his report before the court now th when there is no law written elsewhere that we can use another law over the expert opinion then the expert opinion and their answers and their uh, report would be considered to be conclusive in some of the case as dependent upon the circumstances of the case. I'm not just saying that every time expert opinion is given advantages and every time expert opinion goes hand in hand. No, because when I talk about certain cases ahead, you would be getting to know about it later, right? That there are certain conditions also like where the DNA could be taken up as a conclusive proof and could not be. Coming back to the point, so I was saying that sometimes where there is no specific law that whether this thing to be taken into consideration as a conclusive proof, secondly when the accused have failed to prove his own ground, then the prosecutor's expert opinion, whosoever they call as per the circumstances of the case, they come in and they give their own, uh, I would say, result and they submit their report then it becomes the dilemma again on the court whether they should accept the 45 application or not yes so this is why my question earlier that i put was like when there is so much of forensic evidences we could use when there is so much of criminal evidences we could use then why why there is something that the court do not take a proper and consider it to be a conclusive proof properly you know why? Because uh, I would just give you a little insight about it. We have a lot of, I would say, DNA labs around us, but that is not fully equipped. We have a lot of uh, doctors that do this DNA testing, but then there is a tampering happen to this DNA sample before. Before you extract, before it reaches to the court, the DNA or any of the... Uh, evidences the team collects it get tempered tempered means that the things get uh, manipulated right this is also one of the reason that why Indian court does not completely rely upon the experts opinion and their reports so here I have written two lines about 45 and 46 sections of Indian Evidence Act so it says that the court is not bound to make the discussions on the experts relevancy submissions so court can either accept experts opinion under section 45 or it may reject it second point that i've written here is where there is no relevancy in the eye of law regarding a fact it becomes relevancy of the experts opinion say so then the then the experts opinion comes up and then they say that yes this is the report only I have submitted and there is no other evidence I could submit it and thus in certain cases the court accept those expert opinion uh, reports which is very less 
by now i think no no courts have uh, in every of the cases like of rape of decoity with murder robbery have ever you know considered this thing okay so i would love everybody to have your pen and notebook with you because i am quoting two important cases which is an ancient case i would say and this talks about something forensic uh, evidences right so the, there is one case which is vasu versus santha air 1975 and there is another case which is gautam kundu versus state of west bengal these are the two cases where the supreme court has laid down the certain guidelines regarding the dna testing and their admiss admissibility to prove the parentage um section 112 uh ha yeah section 112 under indian evidence act talks about the parentage so there is this criteria of getting married to somebody and then waited and then to wait and if the um, if the if the marriage solemnized properly or maybe you get divorced and suppose there is no a uh, reunion between the two partner and the child born out of that marriage after this uh, specific time period was given in indian evidence act then you have you can have a question raised before the court related to the parentage so now this is uh, these are the two cases where the supreme court laid down the admissibility that when the dna was considered to be an evidence and how in the case of parentage that courts in india can't order blood test on a matter of course see when i say earlier that dna is a very conclusive proof of evidence in my opinion but there are certain uh, courts that does not consider that way moreover there is this new concept that the blood test can't be asked every time from the parties and the blood test is not considered to be again and yet conclusive proof So guys these are the all discrepancies in our Indian judiciary system that leads to non admissibility of the forensic evidences and criminal evidences because blood test is nothing but blood test can also for in the case of narcotics and drugs or alcoholism so this blood test can prove whether the person was under what kind of level of alcohol if this was a i would say salman khan case or if this was any other you know road rash cases just having have this report submitted before the court that this person was highly intoxicated won't you think that that would be enough for that person to come under the prison and just to have its own punishment i think that's a fair enough right what do you think about it if is right just give me a thumbs up so that i could understand that yes you people understood my concept okay uh then there is this scene comes about dna technology right dna technology and how it is going towards uh crime detection how a dna is actually i would say detecting a particular crime uh i would give you a little uh, i would say one liner which says that dna not only detects what a crime has committed there and then DNA also has this property to understand what other crime this person could have committed knowing by the emotional and the mental condition so that we as a citizen or the authorities can stop that person for committing future crimes yes this is something a very essential point of dna where we think that most of everybody i would say is ignorant of so how cool is that that before anybody can commit any suicide or do any of the wrong just by the dna we could understand his uh, behavioral pattern we could understand his mental peace or disturbance so that we could protect the society from further harm let's not let's not get into that thing so i was already mentioned section 53 and 54 of crpc that is the medical examination done of accused and the medical examination done of this arrested person so this examination is done by the registered medical practitioner that needed to be present before the 5 kilometers radius of the police station 
so these are the technical things that i would love you to understand it because you are a law student and these are the things that would help to make your case a little better and stronger right now i would talk about some discrepancies the evidence act or i would say the indian judiciary have related to admissibility of criminal and forensic evidence right uh before that i wanted to quote here that section 27 sub clause 1 of prevention of terrorism act it also gives the indian court the power and this power is mandatory mind you guys this power that i'm going to tell which is mentioned under section 27 sub clause 1 of pota it says that when an investigation officer requests the court of cjm or the court of cmm chief judicial magistrate or chief metropolitan magistrate so if they request if the io request cmm or cjm for obtaining the sample of handwriting footprint fingerprint or whatsoever the data that they wanted then the court shall under its mandate lawfully grant the permission thereon so i think that this is something which is discrepant in our indian judiciary because in the pota act the court has a mandate power just because it is a terrorism act and just because this terror terrorist could be harmful to our country as a whole so we are giving this whole power in the hands of the court like okay if you wanted to have a dna requested by the io we could do that but my question is like why these acts and these powers are not affiliated and mentioned in the indian evidence act and made mandate to all the indian courts for the petty issues i really wanted to know this secondly guys there was this malimath committee who has submitted its report recommending about certain things that needed to be done in order to have this better and wider level of admissibility evidences of forensic and criminal nature and they say that the section 313 of crpc must be amended i think everybody knows about what is section 313 of crpc section 313 of crpc says that the accused would be acquitted if there is no ground to be proof against the accused so they say malimath committee say that why you do need to uh, acquit the accused on any non finding of evidences against him if you have even one forensic evidence one medical evidence or even one criminal evidence then why you are acquitting it just having either of these three or three of them together that is sufficient cause for setting an accused behind the bar but this has nothing happened in india so far and these are the recommendations malimath committee has provided to amend section 313 of crpc what else they say is that there has to be a national dna laboratory there has to be this national dna um database so that we could protect our country from large amounts of terrorism so that their all datas are been present presentable under one section you know i personally believe that there is this concept of hearsay evidences which says that even as a evidence is becomes an exception under res geste so res geste is under section 6 mentioned in indian evidence act so i would no, i will not go in such a deep because that would be out of my uh, this concept i am just giving you an example that there is this thing that is still practicing in india and have been practicing so, so for a very long time that if there is this oral evidence given for example by the accused side right and the court believe that after determining all the chastity after determining the reliability after determining the veracity or after impeaching the character of the accused it is found that all evidences the accused are making is just to the point and considered to be admissible before the court 
whereas there is this report by the expert opinion from the prosecutor side which says that no this is not the case the accused has said they i have some other evidences which is contradictory to what the accused has said then my friends in that case the court shall not listen to that side of the prosecutor what they do they listen to the accused and the statement this is again one of the kind of the discrepancy that i was talking about so here again the forensic evidences was being neglected why because the court think that the accused should be proven guilt uh, the the accused should not be proven guilty unless every evidence is is considered to be reliable so this is the one thing that i was talking about that even after having so much of experts opinion our indian courts does not consider it to be admissible before it right i have a one case that could make you easy rememberable about this thing yeah so the case is uh solanki ukhabai versus gujarat air 1983 ordinarily the value of medical evidences is only for corroboration which means that medical evidences that you provide before the court that can be either accepted or can be either denied it can never be having any full conclusive proof considered to be admissible before the court i have second other case which says that punjab singh versus haryana state air 1984 which says that if the direct evidence of the witness to the occurrence is satisfactory and reliable then it cannot be rejected on the hypothetical medical evidence submissions this is what i was talking about if the accused has a lot of reliability on his own side in his own evidences then whatsoever evidence is performed by the medical experts or other experts opinion that could easily be overtaken by the accused evidences now i am coming to the last section of my uh, topic and that is where the eyewitness account is found credible and trustworthy the medical opinion pointing to alternative possibility is not accepted as to conclusive this is what it is mentioned under state of up versus krishna gopal air 1988 and before telling you what this case is all about let me just put one liner the bentham has explained the bentham says that witnesses are the eyes and the ears of justice so here i'm talking about again the discrepancies of the indian court who neglected the admissibility of uh, Uh, forensic evidences and criminal evidences and they are looking up for the other evidences to give support so this is the second discrepancy which says that the medical officer stated so this is a little fact that i am quoting here the medical officer stated that the injuries found on the body of the deceased could be result of either two or maybe more than that shots of bullet but the evidence of an eye witness clearly showed that they were only and only present and marked of two bullets understood so this medical expert has given and submitted an a uh, report which says the presence of two or more bullet shots whereas there is this eye witness who says that no there is only an approximately two bullet shot now you would have known what i'm talking about and what the court says is it says that when there is no inconsistency between the medical evidence and the other evidences and inconsistency is deposed by the medical evidence 
is a mere probability and not fatal to the prosecution case which means that whenever there is an eyewitness who has his own reliability whose evidence is much stronger clear free of ambiguity and then in opposite direction there is this i would say other experts opinion report then the court shall take the side of reliable sources and neglect the hypothetical report submitted by these experts opinion so guys i think that i am done for the topic and in conclusion i would just give you two liners the medical evidence or the forensic evidence is prepared by the experts the experts who has been mentioned in the section 45 not clearly but yes directly somebody who is professional and who have a great knowledge in their own field now they are the witness of the truth they write whatever they see they observe by the scene or by, from the people but their testimony neglects considered to be hypothetical not considered to be relevant to the facts of the matter in the case however there is no rebuttal presumption there is no presumption given to these experts opinion reports that they might have whatever they have mentioned in the reports could be right what have they called is only for like one and two times before the court just to make the court understood what could went wrong behind the scene just like that it's just i would say as i mentioned in earlier of my cases that medical experts opinion or other experts opinion they are just a piece of corroboration you can just rebut it you can't just have a presumption made out of it so the forensic or the medical evidences opinion is merely of an advisory nature and in certain way their opinions does not matter before the court so guys this is what i have been telling you since the starting and now i have ended that we need to have a proper administration and the law before the court because our indian evidence act right from section 6 7 8 9 10 11 right from section 5 to 55 we are been telling about the relevancy of facts and these are the section if been taken care goodly in the forensic and the medical evidences factors i would guarantee and i would personally believe that all those pending cases would finish us off early so thank you guys i am done for the day so any questions you have okay let me just uh please repeat the citation of punjab okay yeah so the citation for punjab i have written that's a punjab singh versus state of haryana air 1984 i repeat myself again punjab singh versus state of haryana air 1984 that talks about that whenever there is a direct evidence is given by any of the party then the hypothetical reports of the experts opinion would be neglected okay what else we have is there any research document substantiating the dna result showing the behavioral pattern of the person if yes please let us know the research report wherein it was submitted uh this question is submitted by rai sahab of course i believe that of course there might exist some of the information where the dna could deter about the mental behavioral pattern of an accused and what's of matter in any of the cases and i think that this is a very nice question and i would get back to you so you can dm me personally and of course i'll take that and let you know about it right Okay so we have this one question from Rohan 2028 
in cases in which probative dna evidence offers little or no meaning can you please tell how accumulation of non dna forensic evidence can be used in convicting accused in rape cases sir of course this becomes a uh, i would say very difficult for today's scenario and the way our indian judiciary working because without the dna i think of course the dna is not considered to be conclusive proof before the indian courts and in the matter of rape our indian evidence ha- section have this uh, beautiful section before that crpc section 53 and 54 and uh, 53a if i am not wrong talks about the medical yes 53a talks about the examination medical examination of a rape victim right so you could go and you could have your case strong based on these facts non dna whether you have dna that would just add a little spice to your case otherwise non dna uh, it becomes it becomes little unreliable but then you have to think about other factors you ha- can also think about the behavioral pattern or the previous conviction of the accused i would just make you understand by section provided in indian evidence act uh, give me a second so this section is again i think of uh, 50 3a it would be yeah so this is 53a of indian evidence act rohan which says that in a prosecution for an offence under section 354 section 354 a b c d and section i'm sorry 376 376 a b c d and e of the ipc or for attempt to commit any of these sections uh where the question of consent is an issue evidence of the character of the victim or of such person's previous sexual experience with any person shall not be relevant on the issue of such consent or the quality of consent so your question was ki whether the non dna analysis as an evidence could work in the case of rape victim i think yes definitely but to make it little more effective and stronger i think that if dna reports may add it and court may consider it to be valid i think that becomes the handy and the best thing our indian judiciary could ever done right so yeah what else we have uh without consent of accused is violative of 23 of coi dna without consent of the accused sir since we are here not talking about a complete picture rescue of dna banushali right but i would say do you understand what a section 20 says 20 says that nobody can be uh sorry 20 sub clause 3 says that nobody could be deter themselves to say anything against them right so these are the things that nobody could be voluntarily threaten to give an evidence against them but i think there are certain uh, there is this section under indian evidence act which is uh, section 29 if i am not wrong let me just check yeah now your question was ki whether 20 sub section 3 uh dna can become uh violative of cons- without a consent of accused i would say no it would not having said that and supported with section 29 of indian evidence act it says that confession otherwise relevant not to become irrelevant because of promise of secrecy so if any person of course to that matter of any official authority if they promises any other person that fine i would be not using this evidences against you in any of the matter or they threat or they just intoxicate that person to have any kind of sample of dna extracted from that person depending upon the case to case and how you use this section i think as an advocate uh 20 sub clause 3 if supported by section 29 then this is a complete exception to the case then yes you can have your uh person's dna without its own consent right
Mm, okay, what else we have? Uh, let me just go in above. If forensic evidence is going against accused, okay, and on another part, witness deposition is in favor of accused, which evidence will be appreciated by the court? Bhanushali, as I've already mentioned, that if there is one or more than one forensic evidences, which is in a corroborative nature, where one is accepting it and another one is denying it, then the court can only consider, Vaisa the court does not consider forensic evidences as a conclusive proof, but uh, the court, depending on the circumstances of the case, would only take those evidences which is unhypothetical, which is unambiguous, which is complete reliable and which has much more veracity and more to the character of the party, be it an accused or be it your prosecutor. Please write questions and comments. Okay, so that's Janvi. Fine. I think I have no more questions now. Sure, Janvi, I'll, I'll end the session by 6.53. So, right. so, how did you like the session, guys? Like, just give me a thumbs up so that I could understand that you liked the session and understood all the things that I've mentioned. Or maybe anything you wanted to like add or something. Just wanted to know how did you like it. I hope uh, Rai that I have answered your question nicely and betterly. And I think that... Thank you Bhanushali. Thank you so much. So guys, I think... Uh, what's the time? Okay, we have good 6-7 minutes. Anything you people wanted to like mention or wanted to ask something? I would give you one advi uh, advice that you should not consider only one bare act for any of your case matters. Always consider because all these case laws, uh, whenever the judgment has been written, everything arises and have their own background from more than one kind of law. So in any of your circumstances, you can use your Indian Evidence Act, your Specific Relief Act, CRPC, IPC, and moreover your COI, as there was this best question that I liked it. So yeah, anything and everything you should know about it. Right? So guys, I think that I should now end the session and I hope that everybody liked it. And uh, of course, I am a founder of Law Bear Point Zero One. So you can just go and talk to me and just uh, drop down your messages if you ever have in future. And I would happy to assist you. So thank you. This is Sakshi Sharma, an advocate practicing at Delhi High Court, signing off. Thank you, guys. Thank you really so much.